Amen, and praise God, as Will said earlier, that we get this opportunity today to gather as believers. And whatever this past week brought to you, thank God for this moment that we get to come together and be refreshed by his word. If you would, go ahead and take your Bibles, and you can flip over to Romans chapter 6. As Will said, that's where we'll be this morning. And if you've been around me very long, you've heard me talk about uh, just when we approach God's word. And I think sometimes, and it's not bad, we approach God's word and we may not walk away with the hair on our arms standing up or some new revolutionary thought. And and sometimes we kind of ask the question, like, did I do it right? Like, did I read right? Did I miss something? And that's just not always the case. And and you've heard me use the example of, of me myself, like, If I'm calling and talking to my dad, not every time do I get off the phone and and just think, oh my gosh, that was just extraordinary. But I always get off the phone thankful that I just had an opportunity to talk with my father. And and sometimes that's what we read and, and we're just thankful that we had the opportunity. And yet there are some times when we do read and we do feel like the hairs on our arms are standing up. And we're like, oh my goodness, like this is so good. And, and I say that because this week as I was preparing and I'm walking through Romans chapter 6, that was the experience I was having. And so I'm excited uh, this morning to be able to just walk through this together. And so if you found your way there, Romans chapter 6, we'll start in verse 1. And scripture says, What should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin since a person who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all time, but the life he lives, he lives to God so that you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray and then we'll dive into this text. Father, we are thankful for this word. We're thankful for its truth. For those in this room who have confessed Jesus as Lord, God, that they have looked and realized their sin and they have realized that there is no path out of that sin except through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Father, for those who have confessed that, I pray that today is a day of refreshing, of nourishment, wherever they may be, as we read about the rich gospel in this text. And Father, if there are any in this room who are not followers of you, I pray that even in this moment, your spirit is drawing them near and that the words from your scripture would just speak and enlighten their heart to the truth of what's being said here. And God, that today could be the day that they cry out to Jesus Christ. Father, our ultimate prayer is that through our time this morning, that you would be honored and that you would be glorified. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So as I'm preparing and and writing and and I'm thinking about different things, it it just kind of came to my mind that oftentimes uh, I'll set out in a crowd similar to what you're doing right now and I'm listening to a pastor and illustrations will come up and I don't know why, but so often those illustrations revolve around driving. And there's something about a preacher and driving, I guess, that just doesn't go great because they're always talking about it. Do y'all agree with that? Do y'all sense that? So the other day I was driving, right? And as I'm driving, I noticed something. And it wasn't just the other day. It was like over a matter of what felt like weeks that regardless of the route I took to get to work, there was construction happening everywhere. 
And I had a moment where I'm like half kidding and half true. Like I felt like I was on the Truman Show and like I was Truman. If you understand that, if you don't talk to me later and we'll talk about that reference. But I was like, I feel like as I'm driving, they're like, he's going down park, set it up now. Yep, right there. Okay, he's making his way down Albert Pike. Now if y'all could get going, hurry, hurry. Like I felt that. And everywhere I went, I had to take these detours and different things. And, and we've been there. We've been there when we're driving and we're in a hurry and there's, there's places we gotta be and it feels like there's some type of construction, things that are gonna kind of slow us down. And I was, I was thinking about that and I'm, I'm thinking about our text and there's all kinds of other things that, that was going through my mind and, and how this relates. As I was thinking, man, in life, as the believer, as the follower of Jesus, there is a path that we are set on. There's a path of righteousness that we are called to walk. And we're given the spirit and we're empowered to be able to walk down that path and we're given God's word so it's going to lead us. That's why scripture says that his word is, is a lamp into our path, into our walk. And yet we know as Christians, we know as followers, that as we strive to walk that path, it just seems like we come up on these detours that are whispered in our ear. We come up on these, what seem to be like construction sites that's trying to tell us, hey, 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 this isn't the path for you. You need to go here. And we feel the whisper of the enemy that's trying to tell us, hey, this route you're taking, it's just too hard. Hey, those people that you're called to love, man, why? Look at what they've done to you. When you feel like you're working as hard as you can and you're just getting nowhere and you're getting no recognition and no one's noticing and you feel in your heart kind of the angst of that and you feel those whispers of like, man, you deserve so much better. Maybe you should try this or maybe you'll find some relief here. Christian, my prayer for you and me is that when we find ourselves in those moments, that we can remind ourselves of things like we're reading today. We can remind ourselves the truth of Scripture that we're reading today. And so just for even a little bit of background, as we're diving into Romans chapter 6, if you read the very end of Romans chapter 5, here's what we read about is, is, is the author is, is talking about how through one man's sin, speaking of Adam, that we were then identified with Adam in our sin. And that sin led to condemnation that ultimately led to death. And the truth that we understand is every single one of us in this room were born into sin. And it was our nature and it was who we were. And it was the path that we were on. But then he's going to go on. He's going to say, and yet through one man's righteous act, we are then bought out of that sin and we are purified. We are justified and we are made righteous. And so if we're in this room, and just as we've said all morning, if you confess that Jesus is Lord, then here's what has happened is you have a completely new identity. And you are no longer identified with Adam in his sin, but you are identified with Christ in his righteousness, not by anything you have done, but solely by what Jesus Christ has done. Amen? Amen. But what Paul also knows as he is writing is he's talked about this. And in the time frame in which he's talking about this, there are some Jewish leaders and other people that begin to question this teaching of grace. And they begin to say, well, if you have grace and you know that your sins are covered and there's, there's nothing you can do about it and it's all through this man named Jesus that you're talking about, then why not just go on sinning? Why not just keep sinning knowing that that grace is gonna be there because what Paul would say in Romans chapter five is where sin increases, grace abounds. And so what he's doing is he's addressing these people in chapter six is why he starts out. And he says, what then should we say? Should we continue to sin so that grace may multiply? Well, absolutely not. How can we who are dead to sin still live in it? And so the first thing as we're reading this text that I want us to understand is a proper understanding of grace. 
You see, grace is not a crutch that we lean on to continue down the path of sin. It is the means by our freedom from it. Grace is not the crutch that we lean on to continue down the path of sin. It is the means of our freedom from it. Do you realize in this room that if you have confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are freed from sin? You are freed from sin. Here's what I would like all of us to do in this room. Because while we are freed from sin, we know that as we strive to walk that path, man, we're going to stumble. There's going to be times we fall and, and God's there, he's going to pick us up and urge us along. It's this sanctification process of striving to look more like Jesus. And so because we know that, we know there is still a struggle with sin, but we're not bound to it. And so here's what I want us to do is, is just on your own in this moment, I want you to just think through those sins that just continue to seem to seep into your life and you feel like they have this control on you. I want you to think about even this past month, the past couple of months, maybe this past year. For some of you, man, it may be years that there's this sin that you feel like you just can't get rid of. And as you have that on your mind, I want to remind you, sin does not rule your life. Jesus Christ does. He sets you free from all of those things that you're thinking about right now. And I'm not saying that it's not a struggle. Understand that. I'm not saying that, that it's not challenging and, and difficult. But what I am saying is you are not chained to that by the grace of God. He took every one of those sins that you're thinking about right now to the grave and he rose victoriously out of that grave and he left your sin there. Romans is gonna go on, it's gonna tell us and you need to hear this. I believe that there is at least one person in this room that needs to hear this because every time I preach, I say the same thing. You're sitting there and you may be thinking about all of these sins that are in your life. You may be sitting there and you may be thinking about all of the ways that you have gone against the Lord. You may be sitting there and you may be saying, Chad, you don't know the words that I've said, the thoughts that I've had, the actions that I've done. And every time I say, you are absolutely right, I may not know. But Jesus Christ knew every single one of them when he went to the cross. Scripture tells us that. That while we were yet enemies of God, he went to the cross and he died for us. And that's really good news. That's really good news. So let's have a proper understanding of grace as Paul is trying to say, understand that what I'm not saying is you can just keep on sinning knowing that grace is there, but it's a total perspective chain on sin. He's gonna go on, he's gonna talk about our identity that's found in Christ. Look again at chapter six, starting in verse four. It says, therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. For we have been united with him in the likeness of his death. We will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Understand this, as a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, the life that was headed toward death was put to death and you were raised into a new life headed toward Jesus. As a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, the life that was headed toward death was put to death and you were raised into new life headed for Jesus. And so just as in Romans chapter five, he's talking about how our identity was found in Adam, was found in him, his sin, therefore we were condemned and there was a spiritual death that we were going to face, that spiritual death being an eternity separated from God. Jesus Christ makes a way out and through his sacrifice, as we said, we are now made purified, we are justified and we are made righteous and that is our new identity. 
if you have confessed that, I want you to know that in this room. Your identity is no longer the one who is condemned and have a spiritual death headed for eternity separated from God. That's not who you are anymore if you've confessed Jesus. If you have confessed Jesus, you are now purified, justified, and righteous, and that's how the Father sees you. And that's good news. You have been united with Jesus Christ. And just again, as those acts of Adam united us to him, the acts of Jesus have united us to him in grace. And here's what I love is how the author goes about this as he uses the illustration of baptism. And he mentions this baptism, which we know is a profession outwardly of what's already happened inwardly. See, our old life was buried with Jesus and we were raised to new life. And if we can for a moment, I just want us to celebrate something that, man, we have lately got to experience a lot of baptisms, amen? Can we just give the Lord just a round of applause for that? There was a baptism scheduled for today. It just so happened that the individual uh, wasn't feeling well. And so we're going to get to experience that coming up. And we know that there's a number more that that we're having conversations with. And, And what's happening every time someone gets in that baptistry is what they are doing is they're professing to individuals of something that's already happened. And what they're saying is, I have made Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. And my identity is now found in him. And then there's this beautiful picture of what has happened is, when they are immersed in that water, what is being said there is that old life that you lived is now dead and you are raised in a completely new life. And it is a beautiful picture of the gospel. It is a beautiful picture to what has happened to us as confessed believers. And this identity is so important for us to understand. Because my fear is that some of us, though we are believers, thinks God looks at us and still sees filth. My fear is that some of us would say, I am absolutely a Christian. I absolutely believe what Jesus Christ did for me. And I'm not denying that in any way. But for some of us, when we think about the things that we have done, For some of us, we think about that old life that we lived and we still allow that to be our identity. And when we still allow that old life to be that identity in which the ways we think God sees us, man, then we struggle. We struggle to go to the Lord because we think he's only gonna see filth. We struggle to go to the Lord because we've messed up again and we're going to have to go back and confess the same sin. I wonder how many of us have been there. I wonder how many of us in here thinks about those sins that we've done and we almost don't even want to go to the Lord in prayer asking for forgiveness because we're like, he's going to think I'm just coming again. He's going to remember when last time I prayed and I said, I don't want to do this anymore. Now I'm coming back saying that I've done it again. And it almost makes us not even want to go. Know your identity. Because of what Jesus Christ has done, you are seen as purified, justified, and righteous. Hebrews 4 tells us that because of that, we can approach the throne of God with boldness and courage. God sees you as a son and a daughter whom he loves dearly. He's rooting for you. He's not against you. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to enjoy life. It's what we read in John 10, 10, is that Jesus says, I've come so that you can have life and so that you can have it abundantly. It makes me think, and if there's parents in the room, you can think about your own kids. And you can think about your desires for them. And you can think about the ways you want them to succeed. And I want you, if you're in this room and and you're a parent, man, I even want you to think about just when they were small 
And it was like the smallest little thing that to everyone else just seems kind of minute and not really great, but to you it was incredible. Like when a kid starts to walk, how amazing is that? They do like that kind of Elvis Presley little walk, you know, where they're just kind of stumbling along and you're like, he's doing it. He's walking. And they're like, I don't know about it. There's just something about a kid walking that you're like, that's amazing. Katie and I, there was a couple in our church and they've got a little girl and, and we just told them, we were like, hey, why don't you guys like go on a date? Like we'll watch your little girl. And, and they took us up on that offer. And, and so they went on a date and, and we're watching her. And she's kind of around that age where all that's just sort of starting and and as we're sitting there and we're just kind of playing some different things she kind of gets up and and she sort of starts to walk and Katie and are like oh my gosh it's happening and we were like and they're not here to see it like we're the first ones to see her walk and this is going to have to be a secret that we take to our grave because they can never know that we saw it first and we were amazed and we we're like keep going it's not even our kid and we're like you're incredible and then they come back and we're like, oh my gosh, what if she does it now? Then we can celebrate with them. And she starts doing it. We're like, did you just see that? And they're like, yeah, she's been doing that for like a month and a half. And we're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> the pressure that was going to be on us for the years to come. But then you think about your own kids and how we root them along. I was uh, sharing with our uh, young adults the other night. I was taking a trip to Fayetteville and I was on my way back. <laughs> And as I was on my way back, if you've driven to Fayetteville on 49, you know right now, I mean, it's just a really pretty drive. It's just a beautiful drive. The leaves are changing. And, and as I was on my way back, I just sort of found myself reflecting on some things. And, and man, just as a moment of transparency and honesty, like I could feel myself leaning towards some complaining in my mind. And I feel like the Spirit of God was very kind to me in that moment. Because I looked up in that moment and I see the beauty that's surrounding me. And I feel like the Spirit of God just sort of led me to just begin to list off the things that I'm thankful for. No matter how big or, or small, just things I was thankful for. And man, I would encourage you to do that. I would encourage you this week to take some time to just write a list of the things you're truly thankful for. And again, no matter how big or how small, uh, a part of my list as I'm driving is I had taken a, a cup of coffee and as I took a sip, it was really good. And I was like, God, just thank you that I get to drink this coffee and it's really good. It was onyx, it was great. And then I started thinking about some more things. And my son, I was, again, telling our young adults, my son, he's, he's eight. And Elijah's at a point to where one of the things he wants to do the most is just go outside and throw the football with dad. And when I get home, it's like the first question that he asks, like, hey, you think we could uh, like go outside and, I don't know, maybe throw the football? And I'm like, of course, son, we can go throw the football. And so we're out there, and I'm thankful that for my son, one of the greatest parts of his day is just 30 to 45 minutes just throwing the football. And I say that because when I, when I think about this and how a parent loves their kid, we're out there throwing the football and he catches it and it's nothing probably amazing, but to me, whose dad is, I'm like, that was the greatest catch I've ever seen in my life. Did anybody just see that? And I'm so excited for my son and I'm excited to, to see the, the way that he's developing and the joy that he has. And it, it took me back to, I remember playing football in high school, which is nothing to brag about for me. But I do remember there was one particular night and I scored like one of the only touchdowns I've probably ever scored in my life. But here's what was funny about it. Is I score this touchdown and my dad, uh, for, throughout my high school football career, is he was always on the sidelines and he kept stats for the team. So the coaches asked him, he said, absolutely, I would love to do that. And so he would kind of keep all the stats so everybody could kind of be up to date on, on where everybody was. And so he's always on the sidelines. And I think about that next Monday. We enter into the film room and I remember the coaches flipping through and they said, Chad, we've got a, a question for you. And I'm like, yeah, what is it? And they kind of flipped to that play and they said, if you had to say, do you think you could beat your dad in a foot race? And I was like, what are you talking about? 
And as they play, you see me running on the field. And then on the sidelines, you see my dad sprinting right beside me. Go, go, go. Because that was his boy. And he was cheering him on. And he wanted him to succeed. And we think about these things. Eden now, she, they had a book fair at school and we gave her a certain amount of money to go and spend at the book fair. And she got in the truck and she goes, Dad, I gotta tell you something and I don't want you to be mad. She was like, but I didn't buy anything for me. And I was like, well, where's my $20? You still got that? Like, and she was like, no, no, no. Like, I bought all the stuff that Bubba wanted and I got it for him. And I'm like, oh, you're the sweetest kid in the world. Like, there's no one more sweet than you in this moment. And as a dad, man, it just warms your heart and you're cheering them on. Believer, you have a heavenly father who loves you dearly. You have a heavenly father that sees you as a son and a daughter. And when you speak to him, it's not a nuisance. It's a pleasure. Jesus died so that we could have that opportunity. Do you know that? That as Jesus rose out of that grave victorious, it was so that we could have access to the Father who loves us so dearly. You are purified, justified, and you are made righteous. And here's when I think we need to remind ourselves of that. We need to remind ourselves of that on those nights when we're laying in bed and all the struggles are just running through our head. We need to remind ourselves of that when we're just asking the question, why am I doing all that I'm doing? We need to remind ourselves of that when we're driving alone. And man, almost tears start to well up when we think about just the weight of this world and all that we're having to experience. We need to remind ourselves of that when the past does come to mind. And we think about the things that we have done. When we think about the things that have been done to us, we need to remind ourselves that we have a father who loves us dearly. We have a father who wants us to love life. We have a father that wants us to live life and live it in abundance. The passage is going to go on, if you will, look at Romans chapter 6 again, we'll look at verse 6. It says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless, so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin, since a person who has died is freed from sin. Christ follower, you are set free from sin. You are set free from sin. Why was the old self crucified? So that sin would be rendered powerless and so that we would no longer be enslaved to it. And so it's everything we've been talking about this morning. As you think about those sins and you think you may be entrapped, remember that when that old self was crucified, the power of sin in your life died. It's powerless. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You see, our old nature was one of sin. It was how we were identified. But our new nature is one that has a desire for righteousness for the sake of God's glory. And again, it doesn't mean we're not going to battle sin. It doesn't mean we're not going to be tempted. But what it does mean is that we're able to fight. By the power of the Spirit that lives within us, we are able to fight the sin and temptation that comes at us. That sin has been rendered powerless. And in this new life, there's a perspective change on the way we see things. 
You've probably heard me use this example before, but but one of the best ways I can think to describe this is, man, when I got glasses for the first time, and I'm not going to walk you through the embarrassment of that story that I had at the doctor's office of, uh, again, if you've heard it, I literally thought they like hypnotized my eyes when they did the little clicking thing. And I was like, I'm cured. Like, I don't have to have glasses. And he was like, no, no, no. Like, you need glasses. And I was like, oh, yeah, I was just kidding. But I remember when I first put those glasses on, I had zero idea how bad my sight was. I thought everything was fine. And when I put those glasses on and I was looking at the same trees, the same signs, the same house, the same people, there was so much clarity. It was everything I had seen prior, but it looked so different. And for the Christian, when we become believers, we're seeing the same things around us in the world, but we see it in a whole new light. And the reason we do things is no longer for ourselves and for our own gain. The reason we do things is for the sake of God and his glory. We sung about that. We sung the song, Authority. Is this about God's glory? And that's a question that only you can answer today is when you sit in this room, I want you to think and I want you to ponder and I want you to be honest with yourself. Is is the reason we do the things that we do for God's glory? And oh, how that will transform your life. I want you to think about your prayers for a moment. What does your prayer life look like? Is your prayer life one that says, God, this is what's going to make me happy and this is what I believe will actually please you. And so if you could just do this list of things, oh, how great life would be. And I want us to counter that and I want us to think about this. Some of those prayers are fine. Some of those things you may be asking for are not inherently evil in any way. They may actually be good things, but where's your heart in it? Is your heart solely for God's glory or is it for those things? Because here's what happens. If our prayer is, God, I believe this will be great and this will be great and this will be great and I believe you will be honored and that you will be glorified, what happens when it doesn't go through? What happens when it doesn't turn out that way? Are we then disappointed? Are we then questioning God? Are they then asking why? Versus a prayer that says, God, maybe I am asking for these things. But above all else, my prayer is this, that you would be honored and glorified however possible. Maybe you're at work. And you're praying, God, if you could just do this type of work in the place that I go day in and day out, oh, I believe great things could happen. It's a good prayer. But what if those things don't happen? What we've done in that moment is we have limited ourselves. We have limited our mind in thinking, oh, if things could just go this way versus we open up all kinds of realm of possibilities when we say, above all else, God, be glorified. Changes how we worship. What if we worship and we say, oh God, this is how I desire to worship. God, this is true worship. And if I could just get this, oh, then I feel like my heart could truly open up to you. If I could just get this, I feel like I could truly worship you the way that you desire. Versus God, would you just be honored and glorified? Because here we limit ourselves to say, this is the only way I'm gonna be able to worship. And here we can walk away and say, man, it may not be the preference I like or the things I want, but man, God was honored and glorified and that was good. Simple things like our prayer life. And I say this because as we now see ourselves identified as Christ, there is a perspective change that happens in our life. I was watching a documentary years ago. And it was a Christian documentary. It was based on the church. It was based on faith. They had all kinds of people that you've probably heard of, pastors and theologians who were talking on this. They were part of the documentary. And they had one individual, and I just found it interesting hearing his story, is there was one individual who was on this documentary, and he wasn't a believer. And he had grown up, and and he admitted that there was a, a portion of time in his life where he thought he had faith, as he would describe it, But he realized over time he actually didn't. 
And he begins to talk about why, and there's all kinds of details that go in and out of that. But here's what stuck out to me, is this individual was talking about his life, and he talked about the things that he did, and he did really good stuff. He had dedicated his life to serving the poor. He had traveled all around the world with this cause of helping end poverty to the best of his ability to take steps toward that. He had worked at soup kitchens. He had allowed people to live in his home. He had done all of this stuff. And part of his story was he said, I realized I could do all the things that I was asked to do as a Christian. And I wasn't bound to any of the things that Christians told me I had to do. I was serving the way that I was told to serve, but I didn't have to go to church. I was doing all of this stuff, but I didn't have to read the Bible. I didn't have to tell people about Jesus, and I was still able to do the acts. With our new identity, there is a perspective change on what this life is all about. And I want to be honest with you, and I want to be honest with myself. This life ain't all about us. This life ain't all about you. This life is all about the name of Jesus Christ being lifted high. This life is all about us sharing the good news of what Jesus Christ has done. And it's there where we find true satisfaction. It's there where we find true joy. There's a perspective change. Because as this guy was talking in this documentary, what kept going through my head is I was like, but that's not for God. That's not for God. But it's not for his glory. It's not for his gospel going out. That's the difference. That's the difference in why we do what we do. It's not for us. It's not so that our name's lifted high. It's because it's for the one who deserves the glory. And so, yes, we do all of those things, and all of those things are great, but it's why we do them. We do them so that people will fall at the feet of Jesus Christ. They will admit that they are sinners in desperate need of him, and Jesus can lift their face up and say, purified, justified. And when we look at this text, the reason it's important for us to know those things is because we are freed from the sin that holds us back from doing that. Go ahead as we begin to wrap up and look with me at verse 8. It says, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all time, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Here's the question that I have for us this morning. What do you live for? If you're thinking right now, what do you live for? on a daily basis. We say this often, but if it's for God's glory and what we do is for him, and we read this passage and we see that we should consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus, then our life is lived for him. And if that is the case, and our life is lived for God's glory, and we can do away with sin because we know that it has been rendered powerless, then the truth is, no matter the season, the circumstance, or the situation, there is purpose every single day. And you'll hear me say that often because it's true. Because there are some setting in here And they're questioning that. They're questioning the purpose of the job they have. They're questioning the purpose of certain relationships that they have. They're questioning whatever it may be, fill in the blank. The reason we do what we do is ultimately for God's glory. And there is opportunity for that every single day. And so as we look at this text, 
and we realize that there is a new identity, that the Father sees us as purified, justified, and righteous. And we know that there's a father who loves us as a son and as a daughter, and we're not a nuisance to him. But he desires for us to come. And we say, man, I want to grow in that. And then here's just a few application points I have for us, and we'll wrap up. One is preach the gospel to yourself daily. What we just read, we need to preach to ourselves daily. And we need to remind our heart of its truth. Because daily, there's going to be temptations. Daily, we're going to hear the whispers from the enemy that's trying to put us on those paths of detour that says, no, 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 no. This isn't the path you want to take. That path's too hard. That path's going to lead to struggle. That path's not going to lead to true joy. In those moments, we preach the gospel to ourselves knowing that it's a path that's worthwhile. Find biblical community. If you haven't found your way into a community group yet, and we just highly encourage you to do that. Hunter Thompson, uh, most weeks can be found right outside these doors in our lobby. And he would love to have a conversation with you, any of us would, about what it means to be in a community group and, and share with you the different options that you have. Because finding that biblical community is so key to be spiritually encouraged, to have people in your life who's gonna keep you accountable, to have people in your life who you want to be there for you in those times of need when you need to call someone and you just need to talk about life and you need to say, how do I approach this? You need to have those people that are walking with the Lord that's gonna give you sound biblical advice. And as we talk about this, one of the major concepts of this text is sin. Yes, the fact that we're freed from it, but also knowing that we struggle with it. We started out talking about this concept of construction and detours. My encouragement is that we flip the script on that. Is that we each in this room know the sin struggles that we have. We know the tendencies that we have. Prepare yourself for those and, and set up barricades for the whisper that comes into your ear to fall down that path again. Let's get ahead of the sin temptation, know what's possibly gonna come and know how we're gonna handle it before we get in those situations. Let's know that if there's a, a certain temptation that we have, that we have a person we know who's ready to talk to us and we can say, hey, if I ever call you, man, I really need you to try to answer because I may be struggling here. Some of you just need to get rid of some stuff in your life. Hebrews 12 tells us. It says you need to run the race with endurance. You need to run to Jesus the best you can. And whatever sin or hindrance holds you back, release yourself from those things. The sin part's easy. We're able to identify those things. We know what's wrong and we're able to say, I'm freed from that. It's those hindrances, those things that are inherently evil and yet they may hold us back. Sometimes we just need to get rid of stuff because we know it may lead to sin. But my encouragement this week for us is to truly ask ourselves, what do I live for? And if my identity is truly found in Christ, do the things that I live for reflect that? And so we're gonna have a time of response. And here's my encouragement, is as we're led through song, for some in this room, your response is to stand and to sing praises as loud as you can for the sake of God's honor and glory because you know the things that he's done in your life and you wanna praise him because he's worthy of it. For some of you, the response may be, you know that there's some sin struggle that man, you just can't seem to break. Maybe you need to stay seated. Maybe you need to bow at your seat. Maybe you need to come to the altar and you just need to pray. Maybe there's people that, that as they see that, man, they'll just begin to pray for you. But every one of us in this room has an opportunity to respond. And my encouragement is that we would just respond well. And so I'm gonna pray for us and then we're gonna be led in a time of response. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of it. God, I pray 
that we would know that if we have confessed Jesus as Lord, if we have confessed him as Savior, then our identity is found in him. Let us be reminded that because of that, we are purified, we are justified, and we are made righteous. And let our lives reflect that. I pray in this time of response that we can just respond well. Father, we love you dearly. And we thank you for Jesus. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, one more thing. If you are in this room and we talk about this freedom from sin, we talk about this Jesus, and you say, hey, I don't have that, but I desperately want it, then I'm going to be sitting right down here. We have all kinds of people who would love to have a conversation with you, but know that if you need to have that conversation today, I am right here, and I would love to talk with you about what that looks like. And so if you would, I want to encourage you to stand and let's respond.